Welcome to Transformative Principle, where I help you stop putting out fires and start leading. I'm your host, Jethro Jones. You can follow me on Twitter at Jethro Jones. One of the best pieces of feedback that I've gotten during the pandemic with the masterminds that I run is that principals are enjoying talking about instruction and not just talking about COVID rules and regulations. It's one of the great things that we get to do in the mastermind is focus on the things that really matter. And sometimes we try to focus on other things, on the distractions that take us away from our vision, but we're always able to come back because our whole goal is to help us get our schools to where they need to be. So I would love to have you in there. And if you've been listening to the podcast for a while, You've probably heard me talk about it before. You probably have questions. Just go to jethrojones.com slash mastermind and let's set up a time to call, to talk about it. That's jethrojones.com slash mastermind and then click on schedule a call. I look forward to talking with you. Again, that's jethrojones.com slash mastermind. Welcome to Transformative Principle. I am excited to have Jennifer Sullivan on the program today. She is the founder of Fast Forward College Coaching that offers customized college support for learners and their parents as they prepare for the transition to and through college. She's also the author of the book, Sharing the Transition to College, Words of Advice for Diverse Learners and Their Families. Welcome to Transformative Principle, Jen. I'm happy to have you here. Yeah, thank you so much for having, having me. I'm glad to be here. Um, so I want to talk first about this idea of of sharing the transition to college. What does that mean and why is that so important? Well, the transition to college is, you know, is certainly an important shift for students and for families. Um, you know, it's one of the uh, one of the shifts in education, really, for students. Um, you know, we talk about the shifts from kindergarten and elementary school to middle school, the shifts from middle school to high school. And, and I think, you know, most importantly, the shift from high school to college. And it's not just a shift that, that students are undertaking, but it's a shift that parents are, you know, absolutely supporting their students in. Um, and often, it's a shift that parents and students alike don't have a lot of information about. So that's something that I'm very passionate about is, um, you know, having seen both sides, having worked in K through 12 and worked in higher ed and helping to share the information um, and the differences between the two to help families and students. So what, how soon should families start preparing for this? Because it seems like, you know, some people are preparing before their kids are even in kindergarten and others don't give a thought about it until they start applying to colleges late in their senior year. And that seems like maybe that's already too late. So when, when should families start planning this? That's such a great question. I would say ideally it's something to start thinking about in middle school and to really start intentionally planning in high school. Um, you know, now I find, you know, parents that have children with disabilities or intellectual or developmental disabilities really, as you mentioned, start thinking about the day their children aren't going to be with them from birth or from kindergarten, as you mentioned. So it's certainly something that's on the mind of parents. But I think there are really some um, strategic you know, initiatives and skills um, and lessons that particularly middle school and high school teachers and principals, you know, can implement and to be thinking about to help with the transition. So specifically about kids with disabilities, as all my listeners know, my daughter has Down syndrome and we're trying to figure out what kinds of things she should be doing. She's now a freshman in high school, trying to figure out what is actually going to be possible. So what kinds of opportunities exist? Uh, Many years ago, it was not really commonplace for kids with disabilities to go to college. And now you know, more colleges are open to that, more students are, are finding success there. What, what should we be looking for as parents of someone with a disability? That's such a great question. Yeah, as you mentioned, you know, there are a lot of possibilities, a lot of opportunities, and and I find there's a lot of opportunities that exist kind of beyond the dichotomy that tended to exist, which was either career or college. Um, I find that there's a lot of really creative and customized opportunities that are kind of in that middle area. And sometimes even educators 
don't know about those areas or perhaps just aren't thinking creatively about really customizing an opportunity, you know, for a, a young man or a young woman. Um, so, you know, what I would do is, is to encourage um, high school support teams to challenge, you know, children um, to not, uh, you know, and I don't want to be a cliche, not to put them, you know, into a box and say, well, this is their path. We've decided this is what they are or aren't capable of. So really, you know, challenge them um, and, and perhaps, you know, take some classes that would be on a, a college trajectory rather than kind of the opposite and not challenging a student and then saying senior year, well, we do hope our son or daughter goes to college, but at that point they haven't been prepared by the high school team. Yeah. And, you know, we could get into a whole other discussion about whether or not kid, any kids are prepared for college because a lot of colleges say the kids aren't prepared but, you know, we can save that for a little bit later. Um, I want to share a quick story about a couple of students who were in uh, in a self-contained uh, special ed classroom at my middle school. And we had in our district a application only school that they um, needed to, you know, be able to show that they could do certain things in order to to get there. And these uh, these two boys who were twins wanted to go there so badly because they thought that it would be good. And what was fascinating was the school was basically a CTE school and would have been a perfect thing for them to take advantage of. But instead of being a CTE school, that was for everybody, like many things where we start to put up barriers to entry, it quickly became those with the best grades, with the best recommendations were able to go. And these students were on the on the brink of not having a chance because they weren't taking the advanced math classes and and all that stuff. So what was really fascinating is that we saw these boys wanted to go. And so their teacher, who was just amazing, she said, I'm, I'm going to help you get there. And so she took the time and energy and we had that year, thankfully, a time where they could devote extra time to doing that. And these boys worked so hard to make sure that they had the opportunity to get into that school. And gratefully, the district that year changed the requirement so that it was a lottery instead of a qualification. And so they were able to have just as good a shot as anybody else and drew the the straw that made it so they could actually go to that school, which was really exciting. However, these barriers were put up that were not intentionally done to prevent these particular boys from getting there. But naturally, over time, it just became an easy way for that to happen. So equating this to kids going to college, those barriers exist that those with the highest GPAs and the best ACT and SAT scores are the ones who get in. And so now things are changing. In a way, the pandemic was great because it made it so that some of those things went away and some schools are starting to say, well, we don't have to have the ACT or SAT for kids to be admitted. And, and that's good. And some of that was short term. Some of that is long term. So what other kinds of barriers exist and how do we set kids up for success to overcome those barriers, especially if they have disabilities of some sort? Well, I'd like to you know, answer your question by tying it back into something that you know you said a minute ago. I think one of the ways that we can prepare students is by also preparing uh, middle school educators, right? So thinking about that as kind of the ideal time that you know parents and families can start thinking about transition is helping to to include those middle school educators in conversations about transition because I don't think, and in my experience, I don't think they feel like they should be. <laughs> preparing students for transition. I don't know with middle school educators to feel like they are a part of that conversation or, and, you know, as you mentioned, you know, unintentionally, or if they feel like that is their role, you know, but as you just mentioned, you know, in that example, some of the incremental steps and decisions that are made, right. Uh, particularly for students with disabilities at the middle school level can affect their options and opportunities at the high school level and beyond, you know, and at the college level, um, you know, and there are a lot of really great tools out there, you know, for example, uh, you know, I'm on a, a committee that's um, in Connecticut is working to train educators um, using tools called the life course tools, which um, is not a program, but it's just a set of tools and creates kind of a common language for educators and families, um, to, you know, to use as they talk about decisions and, and the tools ask about a good life and what is the vision for a good life. And again, it just facilitates conversation. So starting these conversations in middle school and in high school, I think is really important. And I think can eliminate a barrier to choices that that may or may not be there in a student's junior or senior year. 
Well, and that was exactly the case with with these two boys is that they knew they wanted to do something in the uh, heavy machinery field, I believe, is what they were interested in. And I could have gotten that wrong. But that was a that was something that was only offered at this one high school. And so in order to go down that path, they had to be at that high school. And so being able to think about that early and prepare and plan for it made them able to be much more successful than they would have been otherwise. You know, you, it's not fair to anyone to just throw them into a situation and, and hope that they figure it out. It's it's always best to prepare and plan and make sure that you've got things in place for you to be to be successful. John Cat Educational supports high quality teaching and learning by providing publications that are research based, practical, and focused on the key topics proven essential in today's and tomorrow's schools. The latest John Cat publications include a book whose bold, transformative ideas amaze and infuriate people around the world, according to one reviewer, a title from Global Leaders in Curriculum Planning, Practice, and Retrieval, one book that says stop talking and start doing with regard to teacher well being, and much more. These books used by educators of all roles across North America and worldwide amplify fresh, engaging voices with practical strategies to create transformative change. Learn more in our show notes at jethrojones.com slash podcast. So speaking about kids who who don't have disabilities, what are some of the other things that we need to do to help them make that transition? And this can include kids with disabilities, of course, but <laughs> I'm not limiting it to that group anymore. <laughs> well, that's a great point. You know, I think so many of the skills that we think about teaching students with disabilities are really just good teaching practice and are part of universal design. You know, I talk about that a lot you know, with educators. Uh, we're not asking educators to do more necessarily to support students with disabilities, right? These are just good tools and skills for all. Um, I think, you know, one of the most important skills for students transitioning from high school to college with or without a disability is self-advocacy. And then in in backing that up a little bit, I think self-awareness is so important. When I coach students, you know, I I'm surprised when I ask them questions about Um, you know, their learning style or what time of day do they learn best? Do they have the most energy? Um, Do they know, you know, if they're a visual learner, you know, auditory learner, kinesthetic learner, those kind of things. Knowing about themselves first can help them to advocate for themselves second. And so I think, you know, unintentionally, you know, teachers are are supporting students and sometimes asking questions. I wrote a great article about, uh, you know, how long and kind of examining how long teachers wait once they've asked a question, right? Giving students time to think before the teacher jumps in and kind of answers their own question. (laughs) And teachers don't wait long enough. So I'll (laughs) give you the answer to that question that, um, you know, the research that I found that teachers tend to wait three seconds once they've asked a question before they speak and, and then give the students the answer. But we should really be waiting about seven or eight seconds. You know, and that just leads to the point, you know, that we teachers are kind of unintentionally, we're sometimes we're giving answers and we're not waiting and giving students time to reflect. And that's something that that's a skill that students will need in college. They do need to know how to reflect. They need those critical thinking skills, metacognition. Um, they need to know how they think because those are the kinds of questions that college professors are going to be asking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And those are the kinds of problems that they're going to be solving later on in life, regardless of, of what field they go into, they're going to need to know how to solve their own problems. And, right. and they can certainly go get help from others and learn from others. But truly once they become an adult, there are many things that other people legally cannot do for them. <laughs> and so they, <laughs> right, need to, right. they need to figure that out for themselves. And, you know, this is, this is an opportunity for me to get on one of my soapboxes about student driven learning that the reason why kids don't know their learning styles or what time of day they learn best is because they don't have any control over any of their learning, that it is all determined by their school schedule, by their teacher's schedule, and none of it is determined by them. So when do you learn best? 
I have no idea. I like this <laughs> class that I have in the morning the best because the teacher does this, that, or the other, but they, they have no reason to know what is best for them because they've never been given an opportunity. And so I would just, again, advocate for teachers and principals and anybody listening to this. If you, if you give kids that opportunity to figure things out for themselves, that's going to be beneficial because that is going to help them later in life with a lot of different things, not just with academics, but also with how they, you know, whether or not they have a morning routine or an evening routine or different things that successful adults do, it is certainly helpful. So I think that that kind of stuff is really important to kids' success and not overlooking it and not thinking that it's not important. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the self-advocacy piece because that is an area where, you know, again, kids often don't have any need to advocate for themselves in middle and high school and elementary school. So what does that self-advocacy look like as they are making this transition to college? Well, you know, it's interesting. So as you, you ask about that question, I was just thinking about a conversation that I had at home as a parent, you know, with my own children. <laughs> they were, you know, my daughters were, I don't remember, complaining about something. It could have been that they were hot or cold, or <laughs> it could have been dinner. I don't know the number of things that teenagers complain about <laughs> in my house. But, um, you know, so I challenged them in that next step. And I said, okay, so you're not happy about something. So what is the next step? So are you asking, right? What, you know, ask for help, ask to turn on a fan, ask to, for a blanket, you know, whatever it is. So more than just stating, you know, a problem or stating how you're feeling in the moment, what is that next step, right? And that's, that's really what self-advocacy is. It's, it's having, it's when students have a question, when they have a problem, when they feel anxious, when they don't understand what is that next step. Um, And, you know, and so again, I think, you know, a step in that is, you know, is having teachers, maybe even giving language to students. You know, I do this a lot, kind of providing not scripts, but probably I call them conversation starters. Sometimes students just don't know how to ask for help if they've never had the opportunity. So, you know, creating some role-playing scenarios or, you know, providing some of those prompts, different options maybe for students to choose from because they may not know the right words or they may, you know, kind of the second suggestion here is to, to reinforce and kind of reward positively when students do ask for help. Right. So to listen non-judgmentally if we're the parents or if we're teachers, because students will will learn and will make choices in the future based on how we respond as teachers or as parents. So if they ask a question and we respond with judgment, whether it's overtly or subtly, you know, through our body language, students will learn to ask questions or not to speak up based on the reaction that they get from teachers or parents. Yeah, you know, this is something that we talk a lot about on my other podcast called Cyber Traps, um, which is about the use and misuse of technology. And one of the things that we say often over there is that when you correct a stu- a child and you say this is wrong or whatever, or you shame them, then it causes them to close down and not want to open up and express what they're dealing with. And so, you know, on that podcast, we're talking about pornography and radicalization and and all kinds of things that you can get in trouble with on the internet. And, and that applies to this as well, that what you said is, is really apt when you approach it and listen, not non judgmentally, it makes a big difference in how they respond to that. And so I, I think that that's a really good piece of advice that, that is too easy to forget, <laughs> you know, <laughs> especially as educators, we have a way that we want things to be done and a way we want kids to do things. And, you know, it's, it's very easy to let that judgmental uh, attitude come out uh, and kids can sense it a lot for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and you and I were talking about this a little bit ago, but, you know, I think it's so important to meet students where they are. Right. And so I talked to a lot of parents and teachers about eliminating the word should from their vocabulary. While you're a senior, you should know how to ask for help or you're an eighth grader. You should know how to write a paragraph right? Whatever it is, there's judgment implied just by using the word should. So, you know, so it's really important to, to just meet students where they are and, and it may just be walking with them the first time, right? Doing it alongside them and, you know, making that connection back to the title of my book. It's sharing the transition. It's not something that students are doing alone or parents are doing alone. You know, your, your individual journeys may be different, but you're going through this 
together. And so we need to support both. Yeah, we had a phrase in a previous district that was don't shoot on anybody. <laughs> I've never heard that. Shit on. <laughs> <laughs> but I won't forget. I will remember that now. <laughs> yeah, it's a good one. Yeah. So the final question I'd like to ask you is what is one thing that a principal can do this week to be a transformative principal? Wow, that's a great question. I can only pick one. <laughs> I, I appreciate that that principals support all, support all students. And again, it may be my bias because I am just so invested in students that are in special education. But I, I would love if principals could schedule a monthly meeting with maybe special education or students in special education to ask for their opinion, to listen to their voice to ask what a principal can do for those students. You know, I think so often we try to, and unintentionally we try to remediate weaknesses, but I think we, you know, need to uplift strengths. And so I think being given an opportunity, if, uh, I'm so sorry, (laughs) I come from a higher ed world, I'm so sorry, I keep saying professor. If principals could schedule uh, a half an hour of the time in their week this week or next week and sit down with some students in special education and get to know them as, as people. I really like that, especially because uh, just a couple weeks ago on the show, we had Chloe Sutterfield, um, who is a uh, 22 year old woman with cerebral palsy and uh, is in college right now. And is, she is just amazing. And she said that she didn't have a principal who cared about her until her senior year of high school. Wow. And no principal before that principal had treated her like a human being first. And that made a really big impact on her and uh, just really was a powerful thing. So anyway, I think that that's, that's a great piece of advice and great to uh, great to share that again. If you would like to connect with Jen, you can follow her on Twitter at J S higher ed for Jen Sullivan, higher ed, that's J S higher ed. And then be sure to check out her website, fastforwardcollegecoaching.com. And thank you again, Jen, for being part of transformative principle today. This is a great conversation. Thank you so much for having me. Hey, middle school principals, what if I told you that all your teachers had to do to teach your students really valuable social and emotional competencies was just press play? In Control SEL is a fully automated video curriculum that teachers and students absolutely love. And that's because it's easy. And it looks just like a Netflix or a YouTube show. So all you have to do to hear about how it can completely transform your school is schedule your call. Tell us Jethro sent you and you'll get 20% off if you feel like it's a good fit. So go now to www.incontrolsel.com slash strategy call to schedule your call today. The link will be in the show notes.